Um, thanks for coming, everyone. Well, it's a good turnout. I guess you organise these on the Thursdays because the pub's closed or something. I don't know why else you'd all be here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's great. It's great to have a chance to spend some time down here um, with the team and get some of your work a bit better. Um, just got a small topic for us this evening. Just going to take a few minutes <laughs> and then we'll have it sorted. But before I get started, can I just, I'd just be good to get to the, get to know a bit better who's in the room? So could you put a hand up if you're a student? at the University of Kent, and hand up if you're staff, and hand up if you're neither, you're just an interested other person who's come along. Great, brilliant. Um, so that means there's lots of people smarter than me in the room, so if I cover any territory you know very well, then just forgive me and hopefully we'll get to some new stuff as we go through. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about the work of WWF UK as a way of setting the context for why I picked this topic and then we'll try and break it down and go through it step by step. So our focus as WWF, uh, particularly the UK office at the moment, is just this. So it's to halt the loss of nature by 2030. Slowing uh, the rate of degradation in the natural environment, slowing the rate of loss of biodiversity isn't good enough anymore, or ever really. But those were the kinds of targets that we used to set ourselves in the past. We really want to set a focus now on, on ending that loss and actually beginning a reversal of the loss of biodiversity and habitats around the world. As we talk about it in WWF, we, we describe that as bending the curve on, on biodiversity loss. And that really is our organising principle for our work at the minute. And we think to do that, we need to make it socially, politically and economically unacceptable to uh, destroy nature. And this is how we're going to organise ourselves um, to play our part in delivering that. This is our strategy in a nutshell. As I say, we've got this, this headline goal towards 2030, and there's four particular areas where we, we are going to intervene. Um, the first part I'm going to cover, I'm going to start from the bottom right here, so thriving species and habitats. This is our kind of bread and butter. This is where we try and work in really high biodiversity parts of the world and make changes on the ground that we think can, can make a dramatic difference, whether that's from tackling illegal wildlife trade in Tanzania to addressing the drivers of deforestation in the Amazon, um, you know, various other interventions in, in corners of the world. And then from a climate point of view, we obviously have a very strong emphasis on making sure the UK is playing its role in reducing emissions. Um, and we're using one of the angles we're taking with that is actually the UK is, is arguably the nearest neighbour to both poles. We have territories right close to Antarctica as well as right up close to the Arctic. Um, and so we are, in uni we are uniquely placed to protect that area of the world, those areas of the world, which are actually the ground zero for climate change. That's where a lot of the impacts are happening already. And then if we think about what's driving these changes, food is a really, really big part of that. And so we want to create um, a change in the food system. Uh, we can't do that on our own, obviously, so that food is not a part of the problem, but it's part of the solution. And that involves both changing um, habits in the UK, as well as working through supply chains to have impact overseas. And then all of that kind of builds up towards our planet, your world, which is where we try and mobilise people, businesses, the government um, towards change. So it's really um, creating that movement towards 2030 so that we can achieve really radical things. And the pinnacle of that, I think, in the next few years is what we're calling the global deal for nature. Um, and this is a moment in 2020 when we have the climate, UN Climate Convention, we have the Sustainable Development Goals we just alluded to, which is the UN's organising framework around environment and <coughs> development. Um, and we have um, the Convention on Biological Diversity under the UN all meeting, and there's big, big moments there in 2020. And we need to make sure that there are commitments from individuals like us, as well as businesses and governments that are actually transforming um, the way that we manage the resources on our planet. We have two particular opportunities to really mobilise people, and the first one, I think, is the biggest opportunity we've ever had, which is called Our Planet, and it's a series with Netflix. And you might have seen the trailer advertised recently. Um, it's a really, really ambitious nature documentary. David Attenborough is going to narrate it, of course. But the ambition that Netflix, ha Netflix have around that is enormous. They want to reach half a billion people with that documentary. We've never had that kind of reach before. And on top of that, the, the exercises and, and the the kind of uh, events and, and communications around there want to reach another half a billion. So the aim through the Our Planet series is mobilise a billion people towards um, pressurising governments and businesses to, make, to take, make big commitments in 2020. So that's a really big commitment. And the second is a Living Planet Report, which is really how we underpin what we ask with science. And we'll come on to some of that in a moment. <coughs> the cornerstone of all of that change is going to be this. 
is, is the triple challenge of our time. And it's how we're going to feed a growing, a growing population, it's how we're going to tackle climate change, and then at the same time restore nature. And these three things don't always go well together, as, as you know. Um, so in the next 10 years, we, we might have to feed a population of around 10 billion people. We also have to limit global temperature rises within safe limits. And as I said, we're trying to reverse the loss of nature. So I'm going to take each of these in turn, and as we go, we'll try and weave them through. Um, so bear with me as we do that. First of all, climate change. Climate change is here, it's happening. I think I'll probably be preaching to the converted in that respect. But 2016 was the hottest year on record, and 17 out of the last 18 years were hottest years on record as well. So, sorry, 17 of the 18 hottest years on record have been since 2000. So it's, it's, you know, it's really happening. Um, what's the response? You probably heard of the Paris Agreement. This was a real landmark agreement. Almost all governments around the world signed up to this um, in 2015. And the headline goal of that is just is here. It's just this, that we're going to hold the increase in global average temperatures to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, and we're going to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. And the 1.5 degrees was unexpected, and that was new. It was very significant. Um, and it was so significant that actually we didn't quite know what it might mean. Um, and so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which is a global group of scientists who advise international policymakers on climate science, they were asked to go away and think about, OK, what would it mean to deliver 1.5 degrees and how would we do it? And here's some of the things that they found. So where are we now? Well, first of all, we've already increased global temperatures by one degree above pre-industrial level. So that's in the bank. We can't take, um, we can't take that back at the moment. That's based on emissions so far. And actually, temperatures are rising at around 0.2 degrees per decade based on past emissions, which take a, uh, kind of have a lag effect um, and so therefore global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2052 so that comes back to this moment in 2030 being a really pivotal point in time that's where we might move beyond um, the 1.5 degree threshold but what's the difference between 1.5 and 2 is it, you know, is it really worth going that extra level uh, of effort which would be huge effort in order to deliver 1.5 instead of 2 well here's a few of the differences and there are many for sea level rise, up to 10 million fewer people will be exposed to the risk of sea level rise under 1.5 degrees as opposed to 2. From a biodiversity point of view, half as many species will lose half their climatic ranges under 1.5 and 2. It's a bit complicated, but I'm sure you, you gather it. It's basically a significant benefit. And then half as much land will transition from one ecosystem to another. The Amazon is one of those places that's at risk of turning into a dry, savannah-like ecosystem if temperatures rise too quickly. And coral reefs actually could be completely wiped out under a two degree scenario, but under 1.5, we've got that chance of saving 10 to 20, 30% of um, tropical coral reefs, which is really significant from a fish and food point of view. And then hundreds of millions of fewer people are exposed to climate risk and um, susceptible to poverty under 1.5 and 2. So it's quite a big difference, and I'm going to make the assumption on, for the rest of the talk, actually, that we all want to limit things to 1.5. And that's the basis for how I'll continue. So the IPCC also we map these scenarios. So how could we deliver 1.5? How are the different um, strategies to doing that? And here are the four main scenarios. And we're just going to read through each of them in, in detail. No, not really. I've done a little bit of summarising <laughs> for you. So the first one, this is the kind of really ambitious deep green kind of option. Very low energy demand due to high energy efficiency for heavy change. <coughs> for a second scenario, we've got sustainable consumption, we've got low population growth. So people making more sustainable choices, there's less of us, so we have less um, resource demand. And then a kind of middle of the road option, medium population growth, more like living the kind of lifestyle we do now. And then finally at the end, we continue on a kind of expansive growth path in terms of population and resource intensive living. And there's kind of, there's one really obvious difference between all of these, and that's what happens below the zero line. Um, and these are where we're having to actively take to use strategies to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere <coughs> because we've overshot the, the capacity of the atmosphere at that point to keep temperatures to 1.5. So we've emitted too much, we need to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And the two main strategies there, the brown area is agriculture, forestry and other land use approaches. 
and the green area was this thing called BECS, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, which is this idea that we'll grow plants and trees and so on, we'll burn them for energy, we'll capture the carbon dioxide, bury it underground, and thereby we're extracting carbon um, over time. It's quite controversial, it's untested at scale, um, but it's complete, it's a huge dependency on some of these scenarios from the IPCC point of view. And the brown line there is really saying, actually, in almost every scenario, we need to turn um, forests and agriculture from a source of emissions into a sink, i.e. from deforestation to expanding forest cover. And so both the forestry um, demand and the BEC scenario actually mean that we're going to have to use a hell of a lot of land to deliver these scenarios, which then brings us into competition with things like food. It doesn't make any comment on the type of forests and the type of energy crop in this. So we have to kind of make assumptions and, and um, you could say that we're talking about really calm, dense forests here. So really quite um, expansive and managed intensive forests. So that brings us to the kind of next part of our triple challenge, which is halting the loss of habitats and species. And I'm going to focus on forests as we go through this because, well, for three reasons. One, I know it best. Um, two, over half the um, land-based species in the world live in forests. And three, the connection with climate and food is really, really close. So it's much easier to tell this story. Um, so what's happening? I mentioned the Living Planet report um, earlier. We released a new version of that um, just a couple of weeks ago. You might have seen some of the press around it. Um, we publish this every two years. Um, for I think it's been going on for about um, two or three decades. And unfortunately, every year, the number gets worse. Um, and what we published this year was that wildlife populations have plummeted by 60% since 1970. And what that means in practice is that in this database that we collect with um, ZSL, London Zoo, we have over 16,000 populations that cover over 4,000 species. And if we take the average of what's happened to the population of all those, um, uh, those data sources, there's an average decline of 60%. If you took that onto the human population point of view, so if we said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have a 60% decline in the population of humans around the world, it's the same thing as emptying, and I'm gonna have to look at this list because I never remember it, it's so long, emptying the Americas, Europe, China, Africa, Africa and Oceania. Imagine no people in there, and that's the kind of change that we're talking about. It's really quite significant. So what's causing that? And again, many of you will know this, but actually, you know, there's a whole raft of different um, interrelated drivers here. Um, and actually, we've only been around on this planet for about a quarter of a million years in the context of a 4.5 billion year history on our planet, but we're already the real, that we are the most dominant driving force on what happens on our planet. And these three things are probably the most significant. Habitat loss and degradation, overexploitation, and rising up is climate change, and li that's likely to be the leading cause in a few decades' time, unless we change things. And then behind those, agriculture sits as probably the most significant um, underlying pressure that's, that's leading to these, these, um, these threats. So what would this bending the curve narrative mean for forests? Um, just to recap a little bit, we've already cleared half the forests that we have on Earth. That's over centuries. Um, we still have 4 billion hectares around the world. That's 30% of the Earth's surface is covered by forests. But we're losing 8.8 .8 million hectares of fo natural forest around the world every year. That's, that's a UN figure. It's likely to be an underestimate. Um, but there isn't a real good consensus on what the real figure is. So we need to reverse that, we need to bend that curve. And WWF has joined with the Wildlife Conservation Society and BirdLife International in, ch in championing a, a new vision for forests, which is that we protect, save from loss, and restore a trillion trees around the world. And we think that's what it will take to bend the curve on forests. So we're talking about protecting half the remaining forests around the world or putting them under Im improved management. We're talking about ending deforestation by 2030 at the latest. And that's to fit within the IPCC scenarios as well. And then on top of that, we need to restore um, hundreds of millions of hectares of forest landscapes. And that could be close canopy forests, it could be mosaics of landscapes. Um, the target that's set by many UN agreements is 350 million hectares. <coughs> so this loss of forest is bad for people, it's bad for the climate, and it's bad for biodiversity. So this is what we need to do to turn this particular ship around. Cool. What's the actual maximum tree cover we can have around the world? If we're going to bend this curve, where does it stop? 
How far do we go? What, is there any space left around the world for more forests? So as part of Trillion Trees, we wanted to find out. Um, so we commissioned some work, and um, the team who were at Yale at the time, and now <coughs> based at uh, Zurich, ETH Zurich, looked at where in the world forests are probably the natural habitat. Uh, without, if we hadn't interfered, where would there have been forests based on climate, soil, um, altitude, um, and so on. And then took out all the areas which are already farmland, cities and so on, or already forests or already important habitats for other, um, other ecosystems. Um, and this is what we came up with. There's 1.6 billion hectares of potentially the forest to expand that much more than there currently is now, which from a trillion trees point of view is just over half a trillion. So that's where we get, that's the kind of figure that, that, that follows in that bend in the curve there. We weren't the, uh, the only people who had a go at this, and, and uh, same year, um, the Nature Conservancy led a project to look at the same problem. They did it from a climate perspective, and they said, what role could na natural solutions play in, in achieving the emission reductions we need to deliver? Um, and reforestation was the most significant part of that uh, puzzle for them, and they determined that actually we needed to uh, reforest 678 million hectares around the world. And, there's quite a high uncertainty that we can see here. You know, the figures range quite significantly. There's lots of factors that, um, that we don't quite fully understand in there, but that's where they came out with as, as the figure that um, was possible and also maximised that potential. Um, and it, it's worth noting just in there that they reckon that converting about 4% of grazing land. That's, that's the kind of interaction with the agricultural sector there. And then, so what did the IPCC say? Well, in those scenarios, you saw the brown area of agriculture, forestry, and so on coming below zero, so expanding forest cover. Um, and it's quite a range here. So under all the scenarios that IPCC looked at, the ones that were consistent with a 1.5 degree future were either 100 million hectares less forests, which is a lot of forests, uh, all the way to a billion hectares more. So they're, they're really hitting into this significant um, expansion of forests here. And without putting specific figures on it, that would have involved the conversion of both pasture and non-pasture land to forests. Just to put a bit of scale on here, what we're talking about, 1.6 billion hectares, uh, is almost the size of Russia, um, and the 678 million hectares is about the size of India. So that's the kind of scale we're talking about. And I think what's worth noting here is not the specific numbers per se, I mean you can debate these, you can play around the scenarios, but it's to say that actually there is potential to expand forest cover significantly. Um, and the other thing to take away is that this could be done well or it could be done badly. It could either be a real um, source of co-benefits from a biodiversity and people point of view, or it could be a really carbon-rich monoculture type of setup um, which doesn't have those um, benefits and in fact comes from, with a lot of trade-offs. So there's lots of ifs and buts around this. If we took that to the UK, what would that mean? You know, we're talking globally here, which is really quite abstract, and even this is quite abstract, but we take it to the UK level. This is what our kind of land cover is like at the moment. But if we were to say the UK is going to be carbon neutral as a country by 2050, which is the other part of the Paris Agreement, as well as saying we need to keep temperatures below 2 and, and hopefully at 1.5, they say we need to be carbon neutral globally by 2050. So if we do that in the UK, what does that mean? What's the role of uh, forests in that. And the Royal Society did this work recently um, and they reckon that even if we did everything we could to reduce emissions in the UK up to 2030 and then up to 2050, we would still need to expand forest cover by around 1.2 million hectares. And to just give you a sense of um, scale on that, that's the same as annually planting an area of forest the size of the Isle of Wight from 2020 up to 2050. It's a really, really, it's a 400% increase in planting rates today. We plant about 9,000 hectares of forest in the UK in 2018. We've got to get to 40,000 per year to deliver on this. And the Committee on Climate Change, which is an official advisory body for the government, a couple of weeks later, in fact, I think it was just earlier this week, published a similar report and they found a similar figure. So at one point, they went for 1.5, the Royal Society was saying 1.2 million hectares. And we've done our own analysis in WWF and we come up with the same kind of figure. 
So what this would mean um, in terms of government's own cover, they already have quite an ambitious goal of uh, taking forest cover in the UK up to 16%. It's currently at 13%, I think, but we'd have to take that beyond that into 19% by 2050. The bottom line of that, basically, is that the British countryside and farmland will be crucial to ensuring the UK can get to net zero. We can't do it without tra radically transforming the way we use land in the UK. Um, just to put some proportions on that as well, the, the 1.2 is actually 5%, about 5% of the UK's land. So we're converting 5% of the UK into forests. Um, and the Royal Society has also determined that there's around 1.5 million hectares of available land, which is low quality agricultural or non-agricultural land. So we'd be converting 80% of that into forests. So again, a bit like the global assessment, in theory, the space for this. Space isn't necessarily the problem. So let's pause, take a recap on what we've heard so far. So let's say we want to keep global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. We know that requires protecting and expanding forest cover, among many other things. But forests and the wildlife in them are declining, so we, we, we're already going the wrong way. And that's mainly due to agriculture expansion to feed a population which we know is growing. So I know what you're thinking. It's 6.30, it's Thursday evening. What are we going to eat? <laughs> good question. So we need to put sustainable food on our plates. And the food system currently accounts for 60% of biodiversity loss. So it's a huge driver of um, the loss of nature, um, as we describe it in WWF. And it's the third and probably most important part of um, the triple challenge. So we need to transform things right the way from soil to the shopping basket. And here's some of the reasons why food is so important from a biodiversity point of view and a climate point of view. So 25% of the world's carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions linked to the food sector. 50% of habitable land is used to produce food. And 70% of available water is used to produce food. Just to give a sense of how food or the agriculture and forest sectors are in fates are intertwined, you just look at the different um, regions here. So in the tropics, you can see that the expansion of agriculture area is almost directly equivalent to the decline in forest area. And you just flip that on its head for temperate um, and boreal regions as well. So the two fates are really intrinsically uh, combined. Oh, wrong way. And then this is quite a stark statistic. I think if you added up all the biomass of all the animals on our planet, and you said, you know, what's that made up of? 60% of that is livestock. 36% is humans, and only 4% is wild, wild animals. That gives you a sense of how we've transformed the makeup of, um, well, life on Earth. Sorry, I'm getting used to this pointer. Bear with me. So, with the growing population, surely we need to expand food and the agricultural land even further. And we know that that encroaches into forests, and we know it goes the wrong way from a climate point of view. So how does this work? How are we going to make this, um, this, this work? And at WWF, we think this is a solvable problem. It's not an easy problem, but it's solvable. And here are some of the ways in which, these are some of the reasons why we think it can be done. Food system is not efficient. We already produce more than enough food to meet the calorific needs of the global population. Around 30% of food that's produced is wasted. And we currently feed our livestock almost as much as we feed ourselves. We've degraded around a quarter of agricultural land around the world, so through rehabilitation, which have potential to relieve some of the pressure on encroaching into natural ecosystems. And if we eat more healthily, we'll actually eat more sustainably at the same time. The UK, if UK meat consumption was halved, that would bring it pretty much in line with World Health Organization guidelines. But what's stopping us doing this? What's stopping us meeting this triple challenge? And I think what I would argue is there's a bit of a taboo around some issues. But if we take a step back and say, look at the research that I've covered, we've covered lots of different um, sources and lots of different research, and almost all of them identify two ways in which we can tackle this triple challenge? How can we find a way through this? And the first one is quite obvious and 
basically, the, the quicker we reduce emissions, the more we reduce emissions within the next five, ten years, the less we need to rely on, or the less we'll encroach into this challenge. The less forest expansion we'll need, the less BECs we'll need. So, so that's the first thing we can do to relieve this pressure. And the second thing which comes out really consistently from all the research is that we need to change our diet. That's the only other way in which all of these sums add up. And so this becomes a necessary solution if we're going to deliver on the 1.5 degrees challenge. But it's controversial and can be quite difficult to discuss. People are very protective about their diet. It's a very important thing in people's lifestyles. But there are some signs that um, public interest and attitude is starting to change. Some of you might have seen there was a survey published by Waitrose, but which actually reached out to a broader audience than their own customers. And 38, sorry, I think a third of people said that they're already moder moderating their meat consumption. Um, and 38% of those people said that, w that the environment was one of the reasons they were doing it. So maybe we're at a point where that's starting to become a more comfortable conversation. But it's still quite a difficult, di difficult thing to get people to shift. But what would a sustainable diet look like? Um, WF has done some work in this area. And if we imagine that these plates, we like to call them the, the Livewell plates, we have here is the average plate for uh, somebody in the UK at the moment. And this is what we think it needs to be in 2030 if we're going to stay within two degrees. And it's worth noting that's two degrees. So things have moved on. We're now talking about 1.5 degrees. On the face of it, the changes aren't massive. Um, but actually, the important changes here, you can see the animal protein goes down from 124 grams per day to 81 grams per day. And then we have plant protein and fruit and vegetables significantly increasing as a share in their diet. So we're talking about less meat, not no meat, less meat, but also particularly less beef, less veal, um, and then also um, to some extent less lamb, pork, chicken, and so on. We also publish these principles um, to guide everyday decisions. If you're in the supermarket, you don't want to be adding up, well, how many grams of protein have I got? How many grams of carbohydrate? These are the six things that you can keep in mind. Basically, eat more plants, have a colourful plate, eat from a range of different things. Waste less food by you know, using it on time or buying less um, each time you go shopping. Moderate your meat consumption, both red and white, but particularly red. Look for credible certification standards, whether that's RSPO or even RSPCA organic and so on. And eat fewer foods that are high in fat, salt and sugar. And that make up is both a more sustainable diet and also a healthier diet. So let's take this triple challenge that we've been talking about at a global level. Let's take it down to a particular landscape. And we'll look at the Sahara in particular. This is Brazil's tropical savanna. It's an enormous area of land. Just to give you a sense, it's the same size as England, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain combined. And it's a unique landscape. It's, it's full of kind of twisted and gnarly trees. It's a mix of kind of really dense forests and then sparse savannas. And it's got a huge amount of biodiversity in it. 5% of the world's biodiversity is found in the Sahara. You've got 800 bird species, 11,000 plant species, and you've got icon iconic species like the giant anteater and the jaguar and so on. So it's a really, really important landscape. And it's actually a huge source of carbon, uh, sorry, store of carbon. I think there's more, more carbon below ground in the Sahara than there is in the Amazon. But it's actually under threat significantly. It's, it's the fastest, let's try and get this right. It's the fastest, um, we're losing the Sahara faster than any other woodland or savanna landscape around the world. And that's principally because of the expansion of two things, cattle and soy production. And most of the soy we're producing is to feed cattle, chickens, pigs, and so on, um, that then find their way into our diet via meat or dairy. So that all, you know, we're talking about Brazil as a, as a developing um, country. It's, it's got um, huge um, demand for kind of uh, rural jobs and economic development. But the argument we make is that actually this kind of transition is unnecessary because there's 40 million hectares of land that's already degraded which could be converted to the production of, of soy or for the, the grazing of cattle. So we don't need to be encroaching into new land. But the kind of politics and economics of the situation in Brazil mean that that is not the preferable option to people on the ground who um, are you know, rightly looking for ways to feed their family and pay the bills. So this is a good example of where um, the triple challenge kind of in theory works but in practice doesn't. 
And so we need your help. This is something, as I said, this solving this problem is critical to us delivering our long-term goals, which are very clearly in the interests of the global population. And I've only really scratched the surface of this triple challenge. There's so much more there. I haven't even talked about the water implications of expanding forest cover. I haven't talked about the kind of pesticide implications of intensifying food production. Um, you know, I haven't talked about the food price impacts of, of this kind of scenario. So we need to understand the situation better. We need to find more solutions. And as researchers, both kind of emerging, new, established, and so on, these are the kind of questions that we really need to be looking to answer as a global community if we're going to navigate this path. You know, how best to live a diet shift at scale? It's a controversial topic, as I've said. How do we, how do we encourage people to make that shift? What would be the food price impact of these kind of scenarios? What's sustainable vets look like? That's that bioenergy carbon capture and storage scenario that I talked about earlier. How do we implement reforestation quickly, responsibly, and at scale? As you heard from um, what I said earlier, we're talking about a massive increase in reforestation rates. And thinking about things together, we, we, we've done a bit of um, uh, an analysis of what, of what the research out there says at the moment. And most of the time, we're talking about looking at two of these scenarios in one go. But actually, we need all three of these things to be thought about together. Food, climate, and um, habitats for nature. Not two of those um, in one go. And then, okay, we've got these global scenarios. What about looking at local studies and case studies and how we solve it locally, for example, in the Sahara? And maybe there's something around how we phase these things. Maybe, for example, we need renewable energy from hydropower for the next 10 years, but in 10 years' time, we could remove that dam and then we're opening up forests for um, river wildlife again. So w what solutions could we think about in that sense as well? Because there's lots of gaps in the knowledge. Um, But also, I'd be interested to say, I think there's a couple of really interesting talking points that, I'd be, as, you know, as people who live in Kent, I think it'd be interesting to hear what you think of these things. How would you receive these changes to your local landscape if we had that kind of level of forest expansion in the areas around Kent? What would you think? Would you support it? Would you like it? Would you not? And, and what are the kind of reasons for both of those? And could you adjust to a diet like the one that we've laid out here? So I'd be really interested. Maybe you've got some thoughts and feelings on that. It'd be great to hear them. That about sums up my talk. Um, I also represent the brand, so WWF, <laughs> before your world. So fight for your world. Thank you very much. <laughs>